All right, now we have defined the stocks, bonds, and forwards and swaps. Uh, it's time to go to options and define options. In particular, call and put options. Uh, call and put options are called vanilla options uh, because they are fundamental options. They are options to buy and options to sell. They are pretty much similar to the forward contract, uh, call option uh, being on the long side and uh, put option being on the short side, except in the forward contract, you have to buy the underlying at the end if you're long and you have to deliver it if you're short with the option uh, you can you have the option to do that and you don't have to do that if it's not good for you okay? so a call option is the right to buy the underlying asset and the put option is the right to sell the underlying asset so this is why these are the fundamental options it's the right to buy and the right to uh, to sell which are obviously two natural, the most natural things to, to have. Uh, <coughs> so you can also divide options into so-called European options and American options. And European options are options which can be exercised only at maturity. So uh, if I sell you a call option on, uh, say, Google stock at three months, with a maturity of three months from now for $400, that means that uh, three months from now, you can decide to buy from me Google stock from $400, but you don't have to. Okay? And with the European option, it's, you can do that only at a specific date three months from now. Uh, with American options, uh, you can do that uh, uh, any time between today, when we start the contract, and the maturity, the end of the life of the option. Okay? So American options can be exercised at any time. There is also other types of options. There's something called Bermudan options, uh, which in which you can exercise the option at some specific times, time intervals during the lifetime of the option. But that's more exotic, it's not standard. Um, many, if not most, uh, options are uh, American. We are mostly going to actually discuss European versions uh, because uh, you have Black-Scholes formula, it's there easier. American options typically you have to compute numerically. We will discuss that too, but we will uh, mostly stick to, to European options, uh, those that you can exercise only uh, at maturity. Now, these names don't really make uh, uh, that much sense. It's kind of geographical names, but uh, uh, you can kind of Google around and see where they come from, but it, it's not nothing to do with the actual options features. Uh, there is also Asian options. I'll mention them in the next slide. There is the Russian option because they were analyzed by a Russian mathematician. Um, so the, the names don't really mean that much. Options can uh, be written on pretty much anything. Okay, two parties can agree to write a, a payoff that depends on anything that they agree on. Uh, we are mostly again going to consider stock options. Uh, there is also it's a popular options frequently traded are options on an index on average of stock prices. Uh, options on futures didn't talk much about futures, but uh, we will later on. Uh, options on currency or, or interest rate options. I mentioned a little bit credit risk derivatives. Uh, the uh, which are based on uh, you know options in which one of the parties they, they, they depend the payoff depends on uh, whether a party defaults or not uh, for example you can have um, deri energy derivatives you can have options to buy a certain amount of electricity uh, during a certain period of time for a certain price uh, there are mortgage based securities so options and derivatives which depend on uh, loans and mortgages, payments to, to loans. Uh, you can have derivatives based on earthquakes, so on if you're a ski resort, you may want to buy derivatives which will pay you money if there is no snow during the uh, ski season. So, you know, if uh, I told you that uh, options and derivatives, one, one reason why they exist is to provide insurance against risk. So this would be uh, an example where a ski resort buys derivatives uh, depending on whether there is snow or not. So the bottom line is uh, anything can be an underlying uh, underlying asset or underlying uh, variable for, for an option or a de derivative, but we, we are going mostly to, to use as examples options and stocks.
exotic options. Now, anything which is not a call or, or a put option is usually called an exotic option. It doesn't have to be that exotic. It's just uh, not uh, the, the simple right to buy or to sell. Mm, for example, I'll just mention some. We are not going to uh, dwell too much on these uh, a little bit later on. Um, so there's something called Asian options, again a geographical name without too much uh, reason behind it. Um, Asian options are options uh, we can be a call or a put, but uh, the, uh, the payoff is a function of the average price of the underlying during the lifetime of the option. So why would this exist? Uh, I mentioned the electricity derivatives where you can buy a certain amount of electricity for, uh, um, at a certain date. Uh, now, electricity can be, the price of electricity can be very volatile, can change a lot, like in summer days, depending on whether it's a very hot day or not, whether people use a lot of air conditioning or not, that changes the price of electricity a lot. So if you have a standard, let's say, call option, uh, then uh, the, the whether that, how much that option would pay to you at maturity uh, would really, could vary a lot depending on where the price of electricity is on that particular day. So to make these options less volatile, the payoff less volatile, um, you write them on, you, there is a version, uh, Asian option version, in which the option is written on the average of the electricity price between now and maturity, rather than on the price exactly on that day when you, when you exercise the option. So that's much less volatile. Uh, the average of prices is much less volatile than the price on a single day. Okay, so that's a natural use of Asian options. There is something called look-back options, uh, in which payoff depends on the maximum or the minimum price of the underlying asset during the lifetime of the option. Uh, popular versions of call and puts are so-called uh, barrier options. So the barrier options, the payoff depends uh, also on the maximum and minimum in the sense that suppose you have a call option uh, and uh, it's like a barrier call option would be like a regular call option except uh, it would only pay, for example, if the stock price reaches a certain level, so the maximum goes above a certain level um, or not. Uh, if, it, if it doesn't, the payoff even if the option call op regular call option is in the money, the barrier option would not pay anything. Okay? So um, it, it's, it only pays if the stock price goes high enough, or in some versions if it goes low enough, uh, so uh, if it hits a barrier. Uh, so there is, wh wh why is this popular? Uh, are these options, like is a barrier option, a barrier call option uh, more expensive or less expensive than a standard call option? What do you think? It's, it's going to pay zero uh, in more cases than a regular call option because it's going to pay zero if the stock price doesn't reach a barrier, uh, even when the call option would pay something. So it's going to be less expensive. And this is the reason why they're popular. Uh, if, you, if you're pretty sure that a stock will reach a barrier or will not reach a barrier, uh, then uh, it's cheaper for you to buy a barrier call option uh, rather than uh, rather than a standard call option. Of course, the probability of hitting the barrier will somehow be incorporated uh, into the price of the option. So it's not that you're necessarily going to get uh, a better deal. But if you think you have better information than the market or inside information, or you just don't have enough money and you w want to buy many of these options, barrier options are cheaper. Okay. There is also basket options uh, in which uh, you could buy, let's say, two stocks or a combination of stocks for a pre-specified price at a pre-specified time if you want to. So it would be a call option on a, on a linear combination of a sum or a sum linear combination of stocks. Um, and this is also comes up naturally in some markets. Turns out mathematically that, that it's kind of uh, harder to price in, in, the, in the standard models I will just tell you briefly why here, or I'll, we'll, we'll do that later, the math of the, of the options. Uh, in the standard models, Black-Scholes models, uh, price is going to be exponential or something. Okay? The, the rate of growth of, of stock prices will be uh, exponential. Uh, and, and so it, 
if you are pricing a regular call option, you have an exponential of something minus the strike price, that's your payoff. Right? But if you have a basket of options, you have a, let's say, a, a basket option, which is just uh, an option written on a sum of two stocks, uh, then you have sum of exponentials. And sum of exponentials is not an exponential. It's, it's an, um, kind of an ugly function. If you have an exponential of a normal random variable plus an exponential of a normal random variable, the random variable that you get is not easy to deal with, uh, which is why it's not so easy to pri price basket options in terms of explicit solutions. The same reason for Asian options, actually. Asian options are kind of very natural, but they are mathematically hard to price explicitly because you're talking about average of prices. There, it's average over time. For basket options, it's an average of different stock prices, different stocks. In uh, Asian options, it's the average of uh, same stock, but at different times. But mathematically, it's the same thing. You have a sum of exponentials of normal random variables in the Black-Scholes model, which creates uh, um, difficulties mathematically. Although numerically, you can always do that. Uh, again, we'll come to these, uh, these uh, mathematical uh, issues later on. Okay, uh, just to make sure the, we have all the terminology we need. So selling an option is also, uh, you also say that you write an option. It's uh, writing an option. Uh, I already mentioned that the, the, the what you pay as a buyer of the option at the, at the initiation of the contract is called price, value, or premium. And that we did already, and then uh, you, you can you say that option is in, at, or out of the money. Okay. Uh, suppose that it's an option on Google stock for four hundred dollars uh, three months from now. Uh, if today uh, the the Google stock is exactly four hundred dollars, you say that the option is at the money. Okay. So the strike price is exactly equal to the current underlying price. You say that the option is at the money. Um, if uh, if the Google, if the Google stock is uh, four hundred and five dollars now, uh, so that if you exercised it right away, you would actually make money because you would pay four hundred for something which is four hundred and five, you would make five dollars. Uh, th then you say that the option is in the money, uh, and uh, finally, uh, if the Google stock is let's say three hundred and ninety dollars. Um, in which case you wouldn't actually exercise the call option because why would you pay four hundred dollars for something which costs only three and ninety? Then you would say that the option is out of the money. If you exercise it, you would get zero. It would not be uh, good. I mean, no, it would be even negative. Uh, you wouldn't want to exercise it. Okay. So uh, these these are the terminologies.